<sighs> Shabbat Shalom, everybody. There is a grace period at the beginning of every semester in college, and that grace period is called ad drop. I don't know how many of you remember this. I don't remember it from my days in college, but I do now as an adjunct professor um, remember it because it's very mo much a part of our lives. And it's hard as a professor not to view the ad drop period as a personal referendum because there are really four different reasons why people actually ad drop a course. Right? It gives a student the opportunity to make sure that that class is the right fit. And so there are a number of factors that go into making sure that the course is in fact the right course for that student. The first is friends' recommendations. Friends will gather around and say, oh, don't take that class, it's a waste. Or you should really take that class because it will really help you a lot. The second is the course requirements themselves. You might look at a syllabus and say, there's just no way I can do that amount of work. Or the syllabus doesn't seem challenging enough. The third, of course, is my personal favorite, and that is you like the professor or you don't. You might not connect with a particular instructor. And then finally, where does this course fit into your overall requirements for graduation, better known as, do I really have to take this class? Those are the reasons why people add and drop classes. We're going to enter now a period of unique instruction on the college campus. So my students, for example, will have an opportunity to take the class in person or virtually. And the attendance in the class will be based on social distancing requirements and whether, enough, whether or not there's enough room in the classroom. And some will be required to remain at home and take the class online. Regardless of the reason, there is an understanding that choices that we make at one moment in our life might not be right for other moments in our lives. It may be literally true, as we note now during COVID, about clothes. Clothes that fit us at one point in life no longer fit us. And that's the flexibility that encourages us to take chances in our lives. When we make the determination that we should try things, and if they don't work out, well, then they didn't work out. But at least we ought to be trying things. I say this to my children all the time. Try it. you like it. And if they don't, then no harm, no foul. Today, I want to encourage everybody to try something new in their life, new in their Yiddishkeit, new in their Judaism. Because if you continue to add to what you do, you might find that your life has more meaning and more purpose. But I would go one step further and suggest you got to give it some time. It's not going to occur overnight. Don't try something once and then give it away because it didn't feel right initially. And so that's what I say about almost every mitzvah, almost every ritual, almost every custom. Try it on. Take it for a road test. Give it a whirl. What's the worst that could happen in your life? Over the past few weeks, I have been giving a course called Ask the Rabbi. And most often, the question that I got over that course is, why do we do X or Y? Why do we do this mitzvah? It came up often over the conversation about kashrut. And if I can't muster up a good reason, or at least one that resonates with people, the next question that almost everybody asks is, so why should I do it? Truthfully, that is the evolution of Judaism. And that's the evolution of Jewish practice since the beginning. 
We have always been in a process of add and drop mitzvot in our tradition. Jewish survival is about add drop. And we're always in the process of adding rituals and customs and dropping others that make no sense. In this week's portion, we have a unique moment that I believe is really not such a stretch in understanding. And it answers the question of how do we make ritual in our lives? How do we transform memory into custom and action? And more importantly, why? The answer is simple to both in order to remember. Let me tell you what I mean. In this week's Torah reading, we read the Ten Commandments. And at the center of the Ten Commandments, there seems to be a typo. Way back in Shemot chapter 20, when offering the Shabbat as a gift to the Jewish people, the language that is used is Zachor et Yom HaShabbat Kodsho. While here in the book of Dvarim, the word that is used is Shamor at Yom HaShabbat Kodsho. There, remember, here, observe. You can see in the Hebrew, at least the words sound the same. Shamor, Zachor. And the possibility of the difference can be explained in so many different ways. Maybe Moses just remembered it differently. But I think that there's more to it than just that. We can't just always describe every difference in the Torah as a scribal error. That's deconstruction. We're all about construction. So Rashi explains, like our liturgy of Friday night in L'chad Odei, Shamor v'zachor b'dibur echad. Right? We say that. Shamor v'zachor b'dibur echad. As Rashi explains, God said both shamor and zachor at the exact same time. And we as human beings only have the ability to hear one. So we put one as zachor and one as shamor. Rashi says that. The liturgy picks up on it. The mechilta informed Rashi. And we recognize that that is possibly one explanation. God can say two things at once. Most of us cannot. But other than Rashi, everybody focuses not on the shamor v'zachor, but the second half of the sentence that says, ka'asher tzivicha, that God commanded. It's not about why we do something. It's because God said so is the reason why we continue to do it. Shamor v'zachor, we hear, we observe, we listen, we remember. It doesn't matter. What we ought to focus on is kasher that God commanded us to do it, and that's why we observe Shabbat. But Abravanel says, there's got to be more. We can't subsist on a Judaism that says, you do it because I said so. We know as parents, it wears out pretty early. Don't go near the stove, because I said so. When you get to be 15, it doesn't work anymore. And so if our Judaism is going to be an adult Judaism, it can't be pediatric in its application. So Abravanel says, we have the command of Shabbat four separate times for four separate reasons. Abravanel says, it teaches us about our nature and about our relationship with God. It teaches us that God is singular. It gives us perspective over time and reminds us that everything has value in the world. Abravanel says we have to continue to evolve in our understanding of the mitzvot or our obsolete mitzvot will be just that, no longer applicable in our lives. Abravanel is doing what I was taught to do from my first day in rabbinical, rabbinical school, and that is to sell Shabbos. Abravanel is selling us Shabbos. And ultimately, that's what I'm doing here today. But I'm not trying to sell one product called Shabbat. I'm trying to sell you an entire package called Yiddishkeit. I'm promoting the relevance of our tradition, of our history, our sacred text, in our community. There are moments that are so significant in our lives that we're afraid that at some point they will lose their impact. There are moments that are sea changes that literally change the trajectory of civilization. 
You can readily access moments in history that have taught us just that. And you can immediately recall moments in your own personal lives that have had such emotional intensity that you want to hold on to them forever. Each of us makes promises in moments of highly intense emotion. An overweight person has a heart attack and they vow to change their eating habits. A casual substance user comes close to overdosing and they promise never to drink or use drugs again. It's natural. But what about these events that aren't near death? How do we hold on to those and still keep them significant? Graduation from college, birth of a child, buying your first home. Each of those we refer to as anniversaries. And anniversaries and birthdays all have their own rituals. Shamor v'zachor. Remember and observe. It's what it's like to remember and then turn it into a custom. It's a way of remembering and then committing to being, to doing better. It reminds us who we are and that we can continuously do better. We create ritual when memories begin to fade. And so I go back to my original two questions. Why do we have ritual? And more importantly, how do we hold on to it? The answer is simple. We have ritual, and the reason why we hold on to it is because we want to remember. We create ritual when memories begin to fade in order to hold on to them. We create ritual when we want to draw on the highly intense emotions that motivated us and animated us in the first place. And when that ceases to occur, when that ceases to occur, we most likely will drop that ritual. I know it sounds odd, but I believe that there will be a day when this pandemic is over and the globe has seen a recovery that we will have developed an international ritual devoted to the lives of those who were lost during COVID. Like we did in 9-11, this will happen, I pray, please God, that we're able to create a ritual so that sometime in the future we'll remember the lessons we learned during this isolation. So that we'll remember the lives of those who died during this pandemic. Look, this year I plan on working with the Religious Affairs Committee on coming up with a way of marketing, marking a significant moment in our young people's lives. I've talked about this before. I'm hoping that we in our congregation will develop a ritual for when kids get their driver's licenses. I know it sounds somewhat silly, but it's not if you think about it. For the first time in these young people's lives, they will actually have other lives in their hands. And they take their own lives in their own hands. And so we ought to remember and signify that moment with a ritual that says, take it seriously and take it easy. This, this significant moment must have more than a gleeful post on Facebook or Instagram. It must recognize the fear in the heart of every parent who gives over the car keys. It has to implore the new driver to understand the dangers of this new responsibility. This ritual must speak to the significant and attentive Resonance every time they get behind the wheel. I've long since advocated for dropping the second day of Yuntif. Rabbi Berman and I talk about this all the time. It's enough already. But I have to be honest, no matter how many times I've made that case, our congregation's just not ready for it yet. So we're not dropping it just yet. Sometimes we add... Sometimes we drop, sometimes we refuse to drop. 
We're not ready yet. So let me go back to one final comment about Shabbos. You know the line from Kiddush. Zikaron lemase vereshit ki hu yom tehila lemikra e kodesh zecher letziyat mitzrayim. It's a great line. It says Shabbos is a symbol of the work of creation. And it is a symbol of the exodus from Egypt. Shabbos reminds us of the awesome creative partnership of the God and humanity. And it reminds us of the incredibly courageous capacity for liberation, redemption, and nation building. What could be a more relevant message for our times? We stand on the precipice of new inventions and new discoveries, new vaccines, Please, God, and new therapies. We now stand at a moment of new liberation from quarantine and isolation. And I pray, may it happen, bim rabbi amenu, speedily in our day. And let us say, amen. We now continue with Musaf, page 184. Chatzikadish, please rise.